trigger warning. Today's episode is going to talk about addiction. So make sure that you always seek support as this is not a substitute for therapy or medical advice. Welcome to the What's Eating You podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie, and I'm a psychologist, published author, and public speaker here to educate and validate. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, Ash Butters, who is a holistic transformation coach. She has gone through her own struggles with addiction and has come out the other side. I am so excited for this, Ash, because I get so many questions on addiction. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure, Stephanie. Thank you so much for asking me to join you here today. I can't wait for this conversation. Uh, Me too. I get about addiction. And whilst I've got, I'm a clinical psychologist, it's not something I've personally been through and it's not an area I've worked in it a little bit but with registered offenders in drug and alcohol programs but I get asked all the time is what causes addiction why don't people change how do you help someone going through an addiction so I really want to hear your story because when people like obviously when you look at you you're successful you look like you've got your life together and you wouldn't think someone like you would go through an addiction I think that's my own We all have these biases of what addiction looks like. So Mm. take me to your story. How did you, what happened? Yeah, absolutely. It's the reason my old podcast was called Behind the Smile because that was exactly my story. Nobody knew what was going on for me at the time when I was at the peak of my addiction. I had it all together from the outside looking in. I talked about ticking life's boxes or living the Australian dream. That's really what I had been striving to do my whole life. So on paper, I was married. I owned my own home. I was working for a Fortune 500 company flying around the world. I was doing all the things and yet I had this God-shaped hole in my soul that I couldn't seem to fill with anything, like nothing worked. And I tried everything. But the thing that I continued to come back to was alcohol. And for me, I think I was probably born an alcoholic. And the reason I say that is because I have a dad who is public about being an alcoholic. And so I do prescribe to the idea that there is some sort of genetics at play because it's all down both sides of my family tree. And so I was exposed to heavy alcohol consumption from a young age. And even from the very first time I took a drink at the age of 12, I just, something happened. I drank to blackout the very first time I drank alcohol. And in hindsight, I can understand that what alcohol did for me was it was very soothing. I don't think I really ever knew how to self-soothe as a little girl. And I had, I, I would classify myself as a type A perfectionist which came with a very loud, very negative inner critic. And so what alcohol did for me was it turned down the volume on that inner critic. And when I was Mm. drinking, when I had alcohol or a substance in my system, it was really the only time that I ever experienced true peace and true serenity. And so I wanted more of that. I wanted to chase that feeling as much as I could Now, what was really contradictory was that I would be chasing this feeling on the weekends and then because I was so obsessed with what you thought of me, I would play the good girl when I was at school. And so I was music captain and prefect and I was friends with my teachers and getting good grades. So there was just this complete disconnect between the two versions of myself and I didn't know who I was in in all of that. So I felt really disconnected from self, which again, led me to want to find external things to fill the internal void. So I think that altogether was the concoction that started to fuel the addiction. Now, alcohol addiction, when I see it, not only in myself, but with many of the people that I've met and worked with over the years, they describe it as being progressive. So even though I drank to blackout at the age of 12, I didn't get sober until I was 32. So there was two decades of heavy drinking. 
the last two years of which I would classify as truly alcoholic in that, and this is how I define it. And I think that the label alcoholic has so much stigma behind it. I use it as a way to try and fight back against the stigma because I don't believe in the idea that you can only be an alcoholic if you live under a bridge and drink spirits out of a brown paper bag. I've met thousands of people who identify as alcoholics who have had incredibly successful careers, families, all the rest of it. And I hate that that word keeps so many people away from getting help. So many people go, I'm not an alcoholic, so I don't have a problem or I don't qualify for the solution, which is, so that's why I use the phrase, but whatever works for people that are listening, alcohol use disorder, heavy drinker, binge drinker. To me, Mm. it was the way that it controlled my life. And so those last two years was really when I started to wake up in the morning and promise myself I wasn't going to drink again that day. And then I would get through till about lunchtime. And then all of a sudden, I used to think that I'd just changed my mind. But really, that was the addiction at play. It's almost like the Mm. hangover had subsided enough to the point where I was able to stomach some food, have a couple of coffees, and then all of a sudden I'd start saying to myself, oh, I could probably just have one tonight. It really wasn't that bad. You're not that hungover. You've shown up to work. You've done, like, again, you're ticking the boxes. It's not that bad. We really try to justify it, don't we? Literally, it's the justification and the rationalization. And here's the thing that's really tricky with that is, you can always find someone who's worse than you. And so if you're constantly using that as the vantage point, I can't possibly have a problem because I haven't lost fill in the blank yet. We talk about the yets, but eventually they happen. And what created, I had a sliding doors moment for me in my story. And that was that in 2018, I lost my brother-in-law to suicide and I remember in that yeah yeah, thank you thank you Steph and I, I remember in that moment something snapped in my brain where I thought to myself life is too hard I don't know how I'm going to manage and I was also very worried about my husband at the time and how he was going to manage and so that's where I that's where the daily drinking started because it and it all just it wasn't a conscious choice as such It just, we actually were getting married two weeks after this happened. And so there was like drinking leading up to the funeral and then drinking leading up to the wedding and then drinking on the honeymoon. And then the drinking just never stopped, but it wasn't, it took two years for me to actually realize that I no longer had control and that the decision to pick up a drink every single afternoon slash early evening actually wasn't a decision at all. It was happening whether I wanted it to or not. Did anyone, was anyone concerned? Did anyone say, hey, Ash, think you got a problem or did you hide it? I was very, very good at hiding it. I, as I mentioned, my dad is in recovery. He's been sober for coming on 15 years. As a fellow alcoholic, he could see the signs, but he also knew that there was not really a lot he could do until I was ready to get help was what he believed to be true. And he was absolutely right. There was probably the odd occasion every now and then in the last 10 years of my drinking, I'd say a handful of times that I would get myself into a situation where I call it burn my life to the ground, or I would have done something really stupid under the influence. And so I'd call my dad the next day and I'd say, dad, I've done this thing. I think I need help. And so he would actually take me to a 12 step meeting But because I wasn't ready, I didn't hear the solution that was on offer. It was almost, I may as well have had cotton wool in my ears. I just wasn't receiving the gifts that were on offer in that room at that time. But the funny thing is that by the time I was 32 and I went to rehab, I ended up going back into a 12-step fellowship and I still attend those meetings to this day, four and a half years sober. So it did work. It was just a timing thing for me. But I was very, very good at hiding it. Mm. Wow. Two questions. One thing I learned in a training I did many years ago is that addictions are a substitute for attachment deprivation. So you mentioned 
you grew up in quite a challenging household. Did you have attachment issues with your primary caregivers? And my second question is, it's a pretty big one, so maybe I'll let you answer that, then I'll ask. Absolutely. The short answer is yes. So to give you a little bit more context, I grew up with a mum and a dad and they were together until I was 17 years of age, but they enjoyed drinking together. So there was a lot of drinking in the household and I had an older brother. Now that's an important piece of the story because the household that I grew up in really valued sport. That was our currency. We were a sporting household. And my brother was an incredibly gifted sportsman, particularly with AFL and with cricket. And so our family life really revolved around his sporting activities. So every weekend we'd be at the sporting field. And I still remember to this day, I would have only been maybe three, three, maybe four years old, walking up to my parents to try to get some acknowledgement and some attention. And they would just hand me a $5 note and tell me to go to the canteen, the tuck shop. And I would eat food, lollies. And so from a really young age, I, you know, food was my first drug. Uh, and I remember eating that to self-soothe. And I'd, you know, I'd buy so many ice creams from the Mr. Whippy van that I'd make myself sick. And so even though they were physically present, I, there was definitely a disconnection. Yeah. And, and I never felt as valued in the family system. And as I mentioned, I rebelled in a way as a teenager, but before I was rebelling, I was actually trying to, I remember really leaning into my academics because my brother wasn't super academic and that really didn't work. And then I ended up playing like 12 different instruments and winning global singing competitions. And like, that wasn't enough. And it was just like, I would just, I was like literally jumping up and down, like, look at me, look at me, look at me. And just, it didn't seem like anything worked. So I do think that that really played a part with me then thinking I'll go find that comfort somewhere else yeah it sounds like you switched between being a perfectionistic overcompensator which is a mode that people use to deal with their issues or you were self-soothing with alcohol I can't be perfect so I'm just going to switch it off when I'm not on I'm going to be off and that the modes that you moved uh, in between and do you know what I think people think oh it has to be abuse it has to be neglect but such a little thing Mm -hmm. even a parent just saying here go get canteen they might mean but what you needed was a hug and attention and acknowledgement and that plays a big role for a young brain it's so true Steph and what's really interesting is when I went to rehab and I remember sitting in a process group and being asked to share my story my timeline and I truly didn't think that I had any trauma because I had food on the table. I had a roof over my head. My parents had stayed together until I was 17, even though they shouldn't have, which is another trauma in and of itself. But I, again, I didn't think I qualified. I didn't think I was worthy of being able to even give myself the grace around that. And so again, this like self-perpetuating punishment that I would experience because I just never felt like I just thought I was a failure. I thought it was my fault. I thought I was weak-willed and that it was all my fault. And through the process of, exactly right, through the process of of rehab and therapy and the healing that's happened in recovery, I now see things so differently. And I also don't blame my parents for a second. They were, no, you hear the saying, they were doing the best they could do with what they had. But it was, yeah, a, a very important point that you make. I definitely didn't have again, from the outside looking in, what would have been considered a traumatic upbringing. We grew up in a really affluent area. And funnily enough, when I was in my early teenage years, my dad took on a role within the AFL, which took him out of the house a lot. And again, so mum and dad were always at functions and parties and they would just put the $20 bill on the kitchen table and that that's go get lunch kids like it was never or there'd be a $50 note and the number for the takeaway pot cheese pizza restaurant and that's how we yeah. just and I didn't think anything was wrong I didn't realize that sitting down and having a family meal was actually really important for a child's development absolutely and the question I had is I want to know is the only cure to addictions and alcohol addiction sobriety have you ever met an alcoholic or someone who had an addiction 
who's able to have one or two drinks because a lot of people say, yeah, like you just have to never drink again because there's something in the brain as soon as you touch alcohol that just switches and you drink till blackout. What's your perspective on that? I have to say, so the first question that you asked was, have I met anybody that has identified as an alcoholic who's managed to go back out and start drinking again successfully? I haven't personally, but I have, I know other people who have. So I don't want to blanket disregard that doesn't happen because it does happen. In that instance, maybe they weren't alcoholic to begin with. Maybe it's that they had become a heavy drinker to deal with a certain something that was going on in their Thanks. life. And then when that was resolved, correct, then their dependency on alcohol was no longer required. For me personally, because I prescribe to a 12-step fellowship and I believe in the disease of alcoholism, as it was explained to me, being a threefold illness. So there's the physical allergy. Like once I start drinking, I, I develop this allergy to alcohol where I can't stop. I really related to that. Then there's also the mental obsession. And what that looks like is when I'm not drinking, I'm thinking about drinking. And so I'll tell you how yeah. this might have played out. Say it's a Monday morning and I've just had a great weekend with my girlfriends. I'm already thinking and planning about Friday night. Where are we going? Where are the pre-drinks? What are we going to do after that? Like it's this constant, whether you realize it or not, al alcohol and the need to drink alcohol and where you're going to drink it and how much you're going to be able to drink that constant mental obsession, that is is another key indicator. And then the third and final part is what was described to me as the spiritual malady. And that's what I touched on earlier in this conversation, the hole in the soul. And in the fellowship that I attend, they that's describe sweet. it as this, this state of restless, irritable discontentedness. That's my baseline mm -hmm. when I'm restless, untreated. Restless, irritable discontented. And, Say it again. Yeah. So it's restless, irritable, and discontent. That is the baseline of an alcoholic. That's how they wake up. And unless they enhance their spiritual life, they, that's how they move and function in the world. And that's why alcohol is such an appealing solution because the moment I drank that, that feeling went away. So you remove the alcohol, you need to make sure that you're doing other things to treat the alcoholism like just because I get sober doesn't mean I'm not an alcoholic if that makes sense like I, I then do other things whether it's therapy whether it's helping another person there's so many beautiful ways that you can enhance your spiritual life but that's become my solution alcohol is no longer my solution but the actual state of being that I was treating can still very much be there so that's wow. why for me I don't think I'd ever want to try and drink again because I think that it would too easily become my solution again. And whether it took a week, a month, a year, I believe that I would end up back where I left. And that's the more common story that I hear. Going back to your question, have you ever heard a story of someone being able to drink again successfully? I don't really, I can't think of a single time I personally have heard that story. And yet I could tell you hundreds of examples of the opposite to be true. Yes. And I always say to people, think about why do you drink? No one ever asks themselves why they drink. I personally hardly ever drink. Like maybe if I'm going out for steak, I'll have a glass of wine. And, but it's not something that's in my life. It just makes me feel sick and it makes me feel tired. And I'd rather just have dessert. I'm a big dessert person, but I was yes. curious as to why do people drink? It's such a not to be judgmental, but it's costly. You feel like crap the next day. You don't feel good in your soul. Like, why would mm. you choose to do that? And mm. I know there's a lot of, obviously, people feel bad, anxiety. I understand that. But, yeah, I'm just always curious. If you're listening to this and you do drink alcohol, not I'm not trying to be judgmental, but, yeah, I used to ask myself, like, why am I actually drinking this? And usually it's just social mm social acceptance. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. 
and a social lubricant. I think that many, many, many of us were never taught really how to socialize without it. And it's just the norm. Whereas what's been really interesting since getting sober is, and I think this is no accident, is that I spend most of my social time with other sober humans these days. And that's not that I have a problem with people who drink. I can be around alcohol. I really have no, I'm so neutral around alcohol these days, which just absolutely blows my mind. But the other thing about sobriety, Steph, is that it's really about creating a life that you are so deeply in love with that you wouldn't want to disconnect from reality anyway. That's where I am at today. Yeah. Like I, even if I could Great. drink, yeah, like even if I could drink, with impunity, I don't want to. Like the life I have today is Same. so incredible. And it's like, why would you mess with that? Yes. And you value that. You value early mornings. You value feeling good. Yeah. Oh my God. I love that. And my final question, Ash, is how do you help someone who has an active addiction or maybe someone who's in denial or won't get help or they go to rehab, they get kicked out of rehab? There's obviously a whole spectrum of things, but if you think someone might be teetering on that addiction side of things, they drink a little bit too much, how can you help them? I think that there's many ways to skin a cat, for lack of a phrase, but what I can share <laughs> was important for me was to have people around me who didn't judge me, who were patient with me. Because as I mentioned, I sat in plenty of 12-step meetings and when I wasn't ready and nothing was going to change that. It can be incredibly painful to witness a loved one in the throes of addiction. But the one thing that never happened was that the, de the door was never closed on me. And so when I did finally get to that point of being ready to ask for help, I was able to turn to, I turned to my mum and my dad and they were both there with me within a matter of, it was like 15 minutes. I arrived at my mum's house. My dad got there. We called the rehab together and we made an action plan. And if they had pushed me away, I don't know where I would have gone. If you've got a friend though, that isn't at that point of requiring rehab, then really I would just recommend allowing them to start to become sober curious. It is, there's so much information out there today. My podcast is no longer running now, but it's all still there if you want to listen to it behind the smile. So many incredible stories of people's own experience with alcohol, alcohol use disorder, alcoholism. And you just need to, I believe, start to identify. You touched on it earlier. Like the first step to change is awareness in any realm that you're looking at. So if you can start to identify with the stories and start to understand, for instance, oh, Maybe an alcoholic isn't somebody who lives under a bridge. Maybe it is this highly successful woman flying around the world who's got, who's got it all together, but inside feels like she's dying. Once you can identify, then I think that you're more open to getting help. But yeah, just don't try your best not to turn the door, close the door on people because I think that's when it can start to feel really isolating and that's when you start to lose people. Yeah. And it's so easy to be judgmental when you don't understand. So I think taking that stance of curiosity over criticism, because there's so many parallels with what you've described and an eating disorder. It's just, there's so much there. My final question is, what was rehab like? Is it like what you see in the movies? Is it expensive? How does it work? Yeah. Great question. So I loved rehab. I am such a fan of rehab. For me, I went to a rehab up in Sydney and the cost of it was covered by my health cover. I had been paying private health cover because at the time my husband and I were thinking about conceiving. I'm no longer married now and we're great friends, which is really lovely, but that was a part of our journey. And as a result of that, I was in a privileged position to be able to use my health cover to cover the cost of the rehab. If you are not in that position then you can be anywhere, out of pocket anywhere from, say, ten to $30,000. It can be really expensive. The rehab that I went to was a private hospital. And the reason I loved rehab so much was because I it completely reframed the way I viewed life, the way I saw life, the way I experienced life, and the way I felt about myself. And I truly believe that that needed to occur 
for me to be able to truly step into my sobriety. They say the hard work starts once you leave rehab and in many ways that's true, but also just having a safe space to do some of that incredibly difficult inner work and inner healing. Looking back at childhood trauma, unpacking the reasons why, all of that for me, doing that in the safe space of the four walls of that rehab was really important. Amazing. Thank you, Ash. I've learned so much in this conversation. If people want to find you or reach out to you, where can they find you on social media? Absolutely. So if you want to track me down, you can head to my website, which is ashbutters.com. I've got two S's at the end of my name. Otherwise, head to Instagram at ashbutters. I'm there as the makeover mentor and I am in the DMs all day, every day. So if you want to reach out and have a chat, I'd love to see you there. Oh, thank you so much. I'll link it all below. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a screenshot, tag us both on Instagram and make sure you leave a rating. Have a great day and thank you so much, Ash. Thank you, Steph. See you guys. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I am truly grateful for you being here. If you got something out of today's show, please take a moment to leave a rating or review. To access more resources or support, check out the show notes below. See you next time.